Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Thank you for coming to our panel discussion this morning on um, the Cross Seed Initiative. What I'd like to do is um, create a panel discussion where we're not doing all of the talking. I certainly will not be doing all of the talking, but hopefully you're going to be sharing your questions and your interests in the Cross State Initiative as well. Um, to start off, what I'd like to do is introduce my panel um, and then find out just who's with us today. So let me go ahead and introduce our panel. Hi, I'm Shelley Montgomery Barth, and I'm the RPE Director and the Adolescent Health Coordinator at the Wyoming Department of Health. Hi, I'm Glorina Stallworth. I am the program manager for RPE, Rape Prevention and Education, with the North Carolina Division of Public Health. Hi, I'm Tommy Keel. I'm with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and I oversee the RPE program, the Essentials for Childhood program, and the MCH priorities related to suicide and bullying. Wow. So what I want to do today is quickly go over what um, the Cross State Initiative is, and then turn it over to my panel members to talk about what we've been learning over the last couple years. Um, what is so part of um, cross state initiative is our money comes from RPE and I just asked how many RPE persons are in the room so what I want to do is explain what RPE is you'll hear it a lot over the next couple days and I want you to kind of be in the know okay um, RPE stands for rape prevention and education program so RPE um, it is CDC funding but that funding actually comes from VAWA so Congress passes the VAWA and then VAWA gives their money to CDC. CDC gives it to the Injury Prevention Division. And then that money flows out to the states for rape prevention. Um, it's base funding, plus a little bit based on population. Um, all states, I think seven territories, do I have that right, seven territories, um, receive the money. And it goes to your state health department. So everybody in this room has um, RPE money wherever you're from. Um, it's really unique money. A lot of times RPE fund, or rape or sexual assault funding is focused on um, supporting survivors. This money is focused on primary prevention of sexual violence, which means we are always looking at ways to stop a crime from happening in the first place, which is a very difficult thing to measure. So RPE is sort of the umbrella we want to talk about, and we used RPE funds to create a cross-state initiative. So um, every state got additional funds in 2014, and we all had to write a, a, a proposal for what we wanted to do with those funds. Some states came together and said, there's so much work we need to do. There's so much information that we need to know. Why don't we come together and partner to kind of expand our base knowledge about sexual violence prevention? Um, and so we created this multi-state collaborative to learn a little bit more about primary prevention and preventing sexual violence, um, particularly in the kind of the um, realm of public health. So in public health, you would focus on risk and protective factors. We wanted to know more about what are the risk and protective factors with regard to sexual violence. Um, in public health, there's something called a social ecology, and we wanted to look at the whole social ecology of sexual violence prevention, and I'll explain that just a little more. Um, I want to pause and see if there's anything I'm missing from my panel person. Okay. Okay. So when I talk about the social ecology, some of you already know this, some of you have never heard of it, so I just want to make sure I touch on it quickly. Um, if in, in this world, if you wanted to know about a prairie dog, you might look at that prairie dog and say the prairie dog. And then you might look at that prairie dog and the prairie dogs around it. And then you might look at that uh, community of prairie dogs and learn where they live and how they live and what they eat. And then we might look at that whole area where that prairie dog community lives, and then we would understand prairie dogs a little better. And that is the same um, with human beings. If we want to understand a human being, we look at the individual and the people immediately around them. We look at their community, and then we look at the whole society around them. Um, what we have done in sexual violence is we're pretty good. We have more people coming. Yay. Um, we are pretty good, we're decent, at addressing the individual level. So we have some um, 
We have some programs where we might go into a school and we might use MVP to talk to young men about um, gender equity. We, there's a program called One in Four. There's a, a coaching boys to men. Okay, pardon? Shifting boundaries. Shifting boundaries. So we have a lot of um, curricula that kind of focuses on the individual and maybe their friends. But we don't know a whole lot about that next level, their community level, or their societal level. What we wanted to know is a little bit more about those outer levels, what works, what's been tested, what's been evaluated, what if we created something and we wanted to evaluate it, how would we do that? So those were the kinds of things we were um, starting to pay attention to at sort of our state level. Um, CDC divides the U.S. up into regions. A lot of federal government agencies do that. Uh, most of us in the cross-state initiative were in regions 7 and 8. But we've expanded. We have members now from regions 4 and 5. Other people in other regions have become interested in this work as well. So if you see your region up here but not a representative on cross-state initiative, just know that it's something that can happen in your state or in your region. Um, Hopefully your people are here to learn a little bit more about it. So these are the states that are currently involved in the cross-state initiative. We've got Iowa, Montana, Utah, Colorado, Michigan, South Dakota, Wyoming, Kansas, and North Carolina. And right now, these are the members from those states. Um, I believe that um, we sent this information, this PowerPoint, to the National Sexual Assault Conference. So I think this PowerPoint is available to you. And if not, please come see us afterward. Um, we can share our information with you. But we can also help you find the people in your state who might have RPE funding or who might be interested in the cross-state initiative. <coughs> So why develop a cross-state initiative? Um, first of all, if you work for state or federal government, you know that everything is competitive and everything is siloed. And this was one opportunity for us to see um, a way to start building a relationship with each other. So RPE funding is not competitive. So we thought it was a perfect way for us to kind of join resources. Um, in state and federal government, there's often quite a lot of turnover, or we hire somebody who's not really well trained in this specific topic. And so we thought this might be a really good opportunity for us to get people educated and up to speed on what the research is saying about sexual violence prevention. Want to get ourselves connected to that research, um, learn how to implement programming at that community or societal level evaluate the community or societal level efforts that we were doing, and practice using shared, and risk, shared risk and protective factors um, as a way to uh, approach this problem with a public health lens. Can I just add one thing, Holly? Mm -hmm. Um, the, other, the other reason that we kind of developed this cross-state initiative was that as public health practitioners, we identified a gap and a need to really understand the research and the research to practice component. We didn't have another venue to kind of access that information. And so this opportunity presented itself and created a, a way for us to sort of gain that information and opportunity to interact and interface with researchers. So that's where we started. Um, what what developed out of all of that was a series of meetings with people from all of these different states and with researchers who are doing work in this area. Um, up here is a list of the meetings we've had. We started with um, our first meeting in January 2015 and had a series of meetings, the last of which happened not even 24 hours ago. It happened last night. <laughs> so we are literally going to bring you really right up to speed here. <laughs> So what I would like to do is um, just kind of go through the different meetings that we've had and talk about some of the things that we've pulled together and some of the things we've learned over the last year, year and a half. So our first meeting was in Atlanta, Georgia in, in January of 2015 and that was a really strategic decision um, because that 
was how we could ensure that CDC was a part of that meeting. Um, we made sure it was easy for them to access. And, and actually, at that meeting, we had one additional state. It was Georgia who participated in that first meeting. I forgot about that. Um, can, can I pause for just yeah. Are you guys still able to hear over the conversation next door, even in the back? Yes, because we're brilliant. <laughs> um, so Georgia participated in that. We were able to use Georgia Public Health space for free, which was fantastic, and bring a lot of CDC folks in. Um, we actually had 10 different researchers at that meeting, and all of the states were able to come and bring at least one person, if not more, including their evaluators or EPIs, to that meeting. And the specific researchers that we brought in, we had Emily Rothman, who spoke about pornography and its link to sexual violence. We had Dorothy Espelage, who was talking about bullying and specifically for LGBTQ youth. We had Victoria Banyard, who was focused, and Laura Salazar, excuse me, who was also focused on uh, bystander intervention, um, and particularly for college campuses. We had Michael Haynes, who focused on social norms. Um, and then from the CDC, we had Andrew Tharp, who spoke about the links between sexual violence and youth violence. And that was also at the time that her um, journal article around the, um, the, the review of shared risk and protective factors had come out. So she shared a lot of information about those links and what we knew about perpetration. Um, Sarah Degue came and presented on alcohol density and sort of its policy links with sexual violence as a prevention strategy. And then we had Matt, uh, Natalie and Marcy, who are the authors of Connecting the Dots, who it was really kind of our first foray into exploring how do we think about the interconnectedness between multiple forms of violence? How do we get more bang for our buck, essentially, um, and impact more than just one type of outcome, um, focusing on a shared protective factor or a shared risk factor? And then finally, we also had the opportunity to meet with staff who are responsible for the NISFIS survey um, to provide some input and feedback about how we use it in our states and ways that we could see um, opportunities for improvement moving forward. So that was a really amazing opportunity for us. We had amazing feedback from also the researchers who were like, oh my god, we didn't know this. When this happens and you put it into practice, you actually need this. So it was a, it's a mutually beneficial opportunity for those of us excuse me, that participated. Um, we had a lot of homework before that meeting. Um, we had asked each of the researchers to send us at least four or five of articles so we could all be prepared to ask them very concrete questions and kind of just jump into the conversation. So there, there was a lot of <laughs> there was a lot of reading prior to that meeting. We had um, very structured discussion questions so that we could stay focused and on target with our focus of moving to the outer levels of the social ecology and focusing on shared risk and protective factors. So that was really helpful, but it was a lot of prep time on behalf of those of us that planned for that meeting um, and prep work for those of us that participated. And then, um, and then we were able to have, as a component of that, there was brainstorming sessions. So the researchers would take about 30 or 45 minutes, present an overview of sort of their work, and then we had opportunities to do a Q&A with them, and it was, it was amazing. It was such a, such a great opportunity for us to learn, and, and we evaluated it and had great outcomes from both the people that participated um, from states and also the, the researchers. I think probably one of the highlights of that was that it not only benefited the folks that were there doing some of the work, but it also benefited the researchers because they often don't get this avenue to sit down and we don't often get this exchange where we get to tell them, well, this would really help us in our work. And they say, well, this would really help us in our work. And so it gave us a different lens to focus with than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. um, it also made them available to us in ways that they've never been available to us before. And now we've learned that not only with the researchers that were at this first meeting, but with other researchers, that if we can send them an email and say, hey, I have this question about this research that you've done or this paper that you've written, they respond. They want their work to be out there <laughs> doing good work. And so that was something that we really didn't know before. There seemed to be this break between research and practice. So that kind of broke that wall down and gave us a whole new avenue to being able to access researchers that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So meeting two we had in Los Angeles um, last year, right at this time last year at NSAC, so we had to miss the beginning. I'm loud, you might want to put that back so I don't <laughs> drown out the other room. Um, so we had to miss the beginning of NSAC, which was really hard for all of us, I think, but it was, it was good that we got to meet. Um, and in Los Angeles, we had the opportunity to learn from Billy Weiss, who is um, 25 plus years with the Violence Prevention Coalition of Greater LA, and has done a lot between uh, around the intersectionality between um, 
gang violence and sexual violence and other forms of violence and a lot of community engagement work. Um, and it was really from Billy that we learned the difference between community-based and community level. And community-based is really that individual, family, and peer level of the social ecology. And community level is really where you're focusing on changing policy, changing social norms, changing economic um, economic environments and then of course the environment in which people live in that community and so we really realized that we wanted to focus more on that community level change in our states rather than just community based um, so that was kind of a big aha moment for a lot of us because we talk about working in communities but we didn't have that clear definition of how we can move to the outer layers of the social ecology with that definition. We also heard again from Marcy Hertz from the CDC and she really fleshed out a lot more for us about those common risk and protective factors across multiple levels of violence, different types of violence, a specifically youth violence we talked a lot about and what we could do. And at this meeting, um, it was a really, really fun thing for us. We went, previous to this, we had had four um, basic leaders in among us who had been doing a lot of the planning, a lot of the work. They had really spearheaded and kept us all moving in the right direction. But we decided at this meeting that we really wanted to break out into some subcommittee teams that were going to start to do our work. And we cast a wide net. We came up with pretty much everything we thought of that we could do as a cross-state initiative. And we were gung-ho and all excited. I think we probably had a list of like 50 things that we wanted to do. And um, But one of the things that we kept kind of bringing the focus back to is what is our mission? What is our vision? What are we doing here? And so we fleshed that out. We got these subcommittee teams kind of organized and moving. We had a couple of guest states. Um, California joined us. That was the first time that North Carolina joined us. Um, California was unable to continue with us, but they were at the meeting with us that day. We also had some federal guests. Um, the CDC was there. Um, some of our project officers were there. We had ASTHO there, which is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So all of the state um, health officers, they represent all the state health officers. So they were there as well to kind to participate and be a fly on the wall for the work that we were doing. Um, this is really where our evaluation group got to work really well and began to evaluate our process. So that'll take us to the next meeting. So that's where I came in. Um, at the, the meeting that was in Los Angeles, our evaluator attended. And so this is where the work that the Cross State Collaborative really started um, taking more shape for us because we got an opportunity from LA to see what was going on and my evaluator came back and said this is something we really need to be a part of so I wanted to share that as the new member of this cross state um, so we did meeting three in Denver in June we had two presenters two researchers um, Dr. Ron V. Astor and he was from the University of Southern California and also we had Dr. Rami Benabishti from Israel and both of them shared with us some of the work that they had been doing surrounding community level strategies as it related to various forms of violence and working with children who um, had military parents. And so they talked about sexual harassment, bullying, and all of this work was done in high schools. So this kind of helped us push our work a little bit further and help us advance. We also talked about um, our, not only their community level strategies, but some of the work that we're doing. We broke out into our groups, our work groups, and did action planning. We talked about um, the importance of engaging different partners in the work that we do. Um, we also talked about the importance of data-driven decisions. And um, as well, she talked about the work groups that we had, but we discussed a little bit more about the work groups taking shape, what are some of the next levels. Um, we wanted to make sure that we have sufficient buy-in from the CDC. And, and what does that look like? Um, we wanted to, in our facilitated group discussions, so what do we envision the cross state looking like in the future? Um, naturally, we want to make sure that we have funds that are allocated. So each of the states, I'm not sure if we had talked about that, but each of our states have in our RPE budgets, we've set aside funds for the cross state to make sure that we have some sustainability because we are all pulling from our RPE funding. So it's not like we have 
just this pot of money that we use just for the cross state, we've all decided that we want to make sure it's part of our budgets. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were talking about the shared risk and protective factors. We talked about successful implementation of uh, community level strategies, informing the CDC, as Tommy mentioned earlier, we evaluate each of our meetings uh, to make sure what are we doing that, that's working um, so that we have sufficient evidence. We talked about bridging the gap with the various violence prevention branches, both on the state levels and um, the national level. Uh, we talked about the key stakeholders. So who's at the table? Not just with our cross-state collaborative, but when we go back and do this work in our states, do we have all of the partners at the table that we need? Um, one of the things that the researchers shared with us in Colorado is that you've got to make sure you think out of the box and that you don't have the same traditional partners and that you're using what works in your community. We talked about the importance of community needs assessments. And then again, like I said, we talked about the CDC buy-in and talked about thinking just totally outside the box. Uh, we did mention a little bit about some of our challenges and um, what does that look out? Uh, look like? Is it burnout? Is that something that we are all at risk of? We're a small group and even on last night we'll talk more about that, but we talked about our infrastructure and um, our leadership structure. What do we um, need additional, do we want this to be a model for other RPE programs? And we do. Ultimately, that is one of our goals. As Kelly mentioned earlier, this is something that can be done in all of your regions. And so we want to get it to a point where we can say, um, not necessarily be a quote unquote a model, but we want it to be something that you can say, wow, we can do this in our areas. Did you either want to share any of them? Anything additional? I don't think so, no. So the meeting four was last night um, from 6 to 9 p.m. So, so we, we're still tired. We worked, we're still a little tired, but we're happy to be here with you guys today. Um, and we've learned a lot along this road. So when we first met in Atlanta, we kind of got our feet wet, learned from the researchers, really were just blown away by how much we learned and how far we thought we could take this. And then when we got to LA, we threw all the ideas out there and in a perfect world, what could we do? Well, how many of you live in a perfect world? We found that we didn't either. So we thought, okay, we're already really stressed. We're stretched. You've heard, you know, we have multiple hats and multiple jobs in the work that we do. And a lot of the work was falling on a couple of people and they were getting really tired of doing all the work, but still love the idea and the concept. <laughs> so then in Denver, we funneled down a little bit further and we were like, okay, let's be a little more realistic. What can we really do with the work that we're doing? And last night, we had kind of an epiphany and an aha moment with this group, which we've all kind of been waiting for, because this is something brand new. So there isn't a blueprint for us to say, well, this is the first step, this is the next step. We're having to invent this along the way, and there's a lot of pain when you're inventing something like that. And a lot of, boy, we've had some difficult communication, and we're all very strong-minded people, and so sometimes we've had to sit back and be gentle with ourselves and each other. Last night, we realized that we have all this amazing information about what's happening research-wise out there and all these great ideas, and we don't even know what our fellow states are really doing with mm -hmm. RPE funding. So we decided we need to take a step back, and we need to really focus on two things that have come out of this that have been incredibly valuable. valuable. One of those is the peer learning opportunities that we have, the peer learning collaborative that we've developed. And it's so important that we take the time now to sit down and learn what's happening in Colorado and North Carolina and Michigan and Montana and South Dakota and Utah and Wyoming. Did I skip any of them? I think that's all of them. And that we really need to know like what our fellow folks are doing. What are our coalitions doing? What are our community groups doing? What's working? This is a time when the CDC and everybody else is looking for innovation in this field, when we're really looking to push into that society level of the social ecology, and we don't know what that looks like yet. But yet we have small examples of it going on in our states, and we haven't communicated enough with each other yet to know. 
But we realized that these face-to-face meeting times for us were really valuable, but we found the most value was sometimes outside the meeting when we were hearing about the work that was going on from other people. So last night we decided, you know what, we need to pull that into our meeting space. We need to make that a focus of what we're doing. We also need to keep the research to practice piece alive because that was so valuable to the work that we're doing. And where we identify gaps, we now have the resources to go to researchers and say, hey, this is really what we need. And the CDC is putting money behind that. They're putting money behind the research grants. They're putting money behind evaluation so we can figure out what works and what doesn't. Because as we're gonna hear about throughout this conference, if we wanna end sexual violence in one generation, we've got to get where the rubber meets the road and start working on it right now. Um, So we decided that that research to practice piece was really important. When we first started out, we thought, well, we want a shared strategy from state to state to state that we can work on. And it sounded like a great idea and we were really excited about it. But then we realized that the culture of all of our states is extremely different. So when you're talking about Wyoming and North Carolina and Utah and you know michigan and montana it's all even even wyoming and montana is different believe it or not (laughs) although we're more similar than a lot of the other ones and so we decided that that probably wasn't going to work very well because what worked in denver was not going to work in matitsi wyoming it just wasn't going to happen and so then we started moving towards (laughs) shared a shared measurement shared risk and protective factor what can we measure what will the measurement be that'll bring us out and i think we're still going to head in that direction But we've decided that we don't have all the information yet. And that information would be really understanding what our states are doing and and what that story is behind the state. So that's really gonna carry us into our next meeting, which we don't know when it's gonna be yet because they're moving NSAC and our RPE directors meeting and all that good stuff. So we we don't know when that will be, but we do know that one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna highlight our states and our work and talk about the way we're structured, the work that we're doing, what our communities and coalitions are doing, um, what we're evaluating, so then we can move forward with more information. And the only other piece I would add is that we kind of came to the realization last night that there's different states that have different opportunities through some of the CDC grants. Some of Mm -hmm. us have the program evaluation grant, some have some other things, and so how do we make sure that we're relaying that information out to our partners within the cross state, and so that kind of relieves some tension for us to have to take that on as an internal group because we have states that are going to be working with the CDC and our jobs will just be to share and relay that information back. Yeah, so we're going to be very happy to utilize all the work that they're doing (laughs) rather than reinventing the wheel um, and making the most use of our time and efforts. And we did find out of our last evaluation from our last meeting that 86% of our members really appreciated the research to practice component more than anything that we were doing. So driven by data, we made the decision that that's really where we need to be focused right now is that research to to practice and the peer-to-peer learning collaborative. Tommy? So so just to kind of give you some more details around sort of how this came about and and what it looks like in practice, um, we could not have gotten this together if we didn't have a partnership with Safe States Alliance. They have served as the fiscal agent for this project. And aside from just really helping us with the facilitation component and notes and those kind of logistical things, it created an opportunity for us to all pool our money together, which is no small feat um, across all of our state rules. And so anyways, it's been like a very seamless process to, to be able to funnel the money through them. We all kind of do it independently in our own state system. We all contribute different amounts varying from I think like a thousand to five thousand dollars. We were very cognizant of the fact that some of the bigger states get more money than the smaller states and we didn't put a requirement on how much people had to contribute in order to to participate. We basically just had the criteria that you had to contribute some kind of money and that you had to participate in a work group and and fully participate in the meetings. That was sort of the criteria to to be a part of this. Um, And we really focused initially on Region 7 and 8 because that was the natural um, catchment area since we already have regional meetings, council meetings, um, and then opportunities just came up where other states would be talking to us and say we're really interested, we'd love to participate in this, this is how we could contribute, and so that was how California and North Carolina kind of were brought into the fold initially. Um, We have really focused intentionally on um, building knowledge and and skills at the state level that has been the, the, the purpose of this um, but it's, I think the secondary piece that we weren't anticipating was the collaborative spirit that we've actually cultivated amongst our states. Um, 
there's a lot of side conversations that happen as a result of this where we're like, hey, do you have the, do you have this work plan language? Can I use that? It, it, it has just re created a lot of partnerships and opportunities for us to collaborate, which has been really exciting. Um, and as I mentioned, so we've all committed funding to this initiative that's been a key component and time as well. And so we're kind of transitioning to this new leadership model, which we'll see how that works moving forward. Um, but it's been exciting and we've had a lot of, um, I think the hardest part about this process is as you, we've grown a lot, but it's been, the conversations have been really challenging and without safe states to be there to facilitate us and keep us on target, we probably wouldn't be where, where we are t today. So it's been really helpful to, to utilize their skills. One thing I want to say too, I think that, and you can change the slide if you need to, but I think uh, what has really been beneficial also is that we see it as part of our work, as part of what we do. So for us, it's not like we're just coming together, doing something extra. It's helping us push the work forward. And so I think that's something that I must say is a strength amongst this group, is that we look at it as, wow, um, I, I don't look at it as, this is something extra I have to do. You know, last night we were all exhausted from six to nine because we had been going all day, but I'm looking at it as a way to go to the next level of the SEM and to also push, you know, it's part of our deliverables from our FOA with the CDC. So we're yep. doing our jobs. And so, how is the cross-state different from other collaborative efforts? I think the key is that it's state-led. We decide what we want, who we want to bring in, what we want it to look like. It's, it's, totally, it's totally led by sort of those of us that are participating in the group, and it's a collective process where we all have buy-in and um, a voice at the table for that. Um, it's, and so this, when we think about what, where this could go next, I, there's some um, challenges, because the CDC has been very supportive. All of us have, we, there's two different project offers that, project, no, three maybe, project officers, I guess, that we right. all work with based on where our states are, and they've all been very supportive, in, um, and CDC has not blinked an eye when we've been asking for this in our budgets or in our work no. plans, so that is to encourage you all to think about that if you are interested in doing something out of the box. Um, the challenge is sort of what would this look like on a larger scale? We know that there are a lot of states that are interested in this, have, are questioning why they aren't a part of this. Um, there would be some challenges in thinking about how do we make this bigger or how, could we include everyone in this process because it is so, um, it is, is very much a collective impact process which is very hard to sustain and so the more people you add the harder it kind of is to keep all of those voices at the table. Um, I think uh, I think on a regional approach, like if yeah. a region wanted to pick this up and take it up, that that is That's actually correct. where this could go moving forward versus continually bringing mm -hmm. more people into to our particular region. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned, the CDC has been very supportive of us doing this work moving forward. So I would encourage you if you all are interested in, in talking to your project officers or feel free to talk to one of us about sort of how we set this up and, and what language we used. We've um, Every, yeah, so yeah. whenever the, the FOA comes out, we're like, okay, where's your, where's your budget justification? Where's your work plan justification? And we just, we all use the same language. Okay. Um, and I think the other thing that's been really key is that we have created a safe place for all of us to openly have conversations about this really challenging work and the struggles that we're having with it, mm -hmm. the successes as well. And so it's been just a really amazing opportunity. And, and as I mentioned, so one of the unintended consequences of that is that we've created these really amazing partnerships across our exactly. states where we can get resources and we can get information that we need from our partners in a really easy way. Okay, so what have we learned through the cross state? Um, we're continuing to learn as we go, but um, we realize that it requires some work and some maintenance. So when we're not meeting physically, we still have to have conference calls. Um, we're still communicating via email. Um, so the work doesn't stop when we're not in the meetings. We realize also that, you know, it, it may be that MOUs are required um, to make sure that the time and, and the money is there. Um, also, um, it, it Time can be a barrier. We talked a little bit about that last night. That's why we took some steps back to look at our infrastructure because we've had maybe three or four of the states that carried the bulk of the load. And so um, what can we do to make sure that the work is evenly distributed and that everyone is taking an active part? Um, of course, CDC buy-in is essential. And so we keep that in the forefront of our mind as we're doing our work because, like I said, ultimately we want this to be something that regionally all of the RPE states can participate in. 
We've got shared ideas that naturally we realize produce the best shared outcomes. And then um, sometimes one of the challenges we learned is that a change in state's RPE leadership can affect participation. We're right there now. Um, we have some changes, and then we have a new little RPE <laughs> person that's going to be here soon. And so we wanted to look at, you know, he doesn't know that, but I'm saying it. So we wanted to look at the, the way that we're, we're facilitating this group and, and step back and look at also ways that we can make it sustainable so that as we're going through the changes with leadership throughout various states that the work continues. Were you about to say something? I think Shelly yeah, was about absolutely. To say and so I think one of the really important things is one of the thing questions that came to me from my leadership is, oh, you know, you're giving fourteen hundred dollars a year to this effort to help bring speakers in and things like that. Well, isn't that money we should be putting towards the communities? And that's money. That's a question that I've heard from other people as well. And I would argue that this is money that goes to the communities. That the benefit that I take from learning from my peers in other states, especially because I'm only 25 percent rape prevention education and I'm dedicated to several other tasks at my state as well that's information and knowledge and resources that I can take directly to my prevention specialist with my coalition and help to build the work that we're doing in the communities and help to build the improve the work that we're doing in the communities so we are in communication on a regular basis about what happens at the cross state meetings and initiatives so it is money that I think goes back into the community and not only goes back into the community but is um, expanded because of the knowledge that we take back from other states and the work that they're doing. For instance, our neighbor to the south gets significantly more money through their grants and has significantly more staff than we do. They have significantly higher population too, so it makes sense. But we would not ever have the capacity to be able to do and learn and work through some of the things that Colorado does. So it's great that I can call Tommy and say, hey, how's this working? What did you figure out? What, what did you use to do this? She shoots it up to me, and wow, there's several hours of my time saved. Get that straight out to my prevention mm -hmm. specialist, and she's able to really do that work. So it is money that's going back to our communities. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about how we've started building some capacity. This is our initial logic model. Yeah, please pass it out. This is our initial logic model, and some of these things have been changed just a little bit. I am not going to read the whole thing to you, I promise, but I would like to read through some of the objectives and talk to you just a little bit about what we we've learned since we built this logic model. The first is build capacity of states to implement strategies at the community and societal levels at the social ecological model. Number two is develop, pilot, and evaluate strategies at the community and societal level using a shared risk and protective factor approach. And three is inform the national direction using a shared risk and protective fa factor approach with an emphasis on community and societal level strategies and protective factors. And I would say that we built these objectives broad enough that whichever direction our cross state took that we still really fit within those objectives. Of course, we've moved a little bit back from that evaluating strategies, shared same strategies across states because we realize that doesn't leave much state and community control over what works best for their state. But we are still really looking at those shared risk and protective factor approaches as we move forward. Um, and we're going to, like I said, wait on the work that Colorado and North Carolina does with that through the CDC and their grants before we take off in that direction with this cross-state initiative. So our initial work in um, coming up in the near future is going to be that state-to-state -state learning, that peer-to-peer -peer learning collaborative, and really trying to figure out where it is that we need to head from here as we see the funding and the research grow and increase through the CDC. So I just wanted to share with you um, a little bit about that. And then we do have a full evaluation plan for the Cross States Initiative. And it is through that evaluation and continuous quality improvement that we do figure out what we need to do next. We had an agenda going into last night's meeting and we blew the agenda up <laughs> probably within the first 20 minutes because it didn't fit where we learned from our last evaluation that we knew that we needed to be. So when we got the right people in the room, when we sat down, we said, you know what? We can't, we can't follow this agenda. This is not where we need to be going right now. This is where we need to be going right now. And I think it's probably the first time since that first meeting in Atlanta that we feel like we've had a really solid direction. But I want to stress to you, especially if this is something that you decide to take on within your states or across states, 
that that's part of the learning process too. Your mistakes can be successes if you turn them into successes. And that's really important. Your, your lessons learned are not necessarily something that you need to say, ah, oh, we kind of screwed up there because we wouldn't be where we are today had we not learned those lessons along the way, had we not thrown it out there and said, we can do everything like world peace in five years. Had we not done that, we wouldn't have been able to funnel and narrow to where we are today. Um, and had we not been patient with ourselves and really rushed into, well, we need an answer right now. And we were really focused on what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And now we're more focused on what do we do and how do we share that with each other and how do we benefit from what it is that we are already doing. Do you guys have anything to add on that? I think that's so after all of these meetings, what are our next steps? So as, as Shelly has pretty much recapped, last night we took a step back and looked at, you know, the direction that we were going in. Um, we do know that we will continue to have shared language. So really instead of developing it, we've already developed shared language for our budget so that we can continue to sustain the work that the cross state is doing and to include this in our work plans that we have to submit to the CDC. Um, and we want to make sure that, if, as we've said and we've talked about our infrastructure, that we have optimal leadership and that our work group structures fit. Um, and we're going to continue to develop those partnerships and look at who's not at the table that needs to be there. Anything else you all want to add about our next steps? Uh, the other piece I guess you would just add, which is more of a logistical piece, is that um, one of the strategies that we've used that's been really useful for, in terms of communication is that we have a Google Docs folder that um, yes. all of us can access, and we've got pretty much the history of this project located in there, inclusive of mm -hmm. research articles, all of the outcome evaluations mm -hmm. that we've had, the white paper, which we'll talk about in a little bit, just kind of um, capacity for all of us to continually access that information because the other piece and reality of this is that, as Gloria mentioned earlier, that folks are in and out with this. We have different programs that are, or program staff that are taking over the RPE mm -hmm. programs in state. So this is a way um, for folks to kind of get onboarded in a really unique way, I think. It's it, for folks that are new, we actually have, is Kimberly in here? I thought I saw her in the back. So Kimberly is one of the newer RPE folks from Montana, and so this, I, I don't know if I'm, gonna, I don't wanna speak for you, Kimberly, but I feel like this has been a good way for you to kind of learn about RPE um, and have a community to kind of access, to ask those crazy questions, because it's, it's kind of a crazy project. Um, so it's been a good way for, on, like for onboarding, which is I know something that we don't, that, that is often a gap for folks when they're coming into this work, is there's not a lot of, um, there's not a capacity around sort of onboarding new RPE directors to this work, so this is kind of one of those vehicles that's that's been developed. And then Shelly is planning on developing a listserv for us so we can more easily communicate so it's not kind of beholden to one person who's responsible for organizing all of this and coordinating. I was going to say one other thing. As, um, as part of our next steps, too, we're keeping on the flexibility hat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we realize that, you know, as Shelly has already mentioned, that as we are going through this process, we're learning. And so we all decided last night, okay, let's not be so rigid. That's why we kind of trashed and tossed our agenda to a degree um, so that we can make sure that we're going in the direction that we need to go in. And I think one of the things that I think that's important um, to point out and to share with you as well is that one of the reasons why this developed in the first place is that this is a platform that did not exist for us. We did have some ability to communicate regionally with each other through regional meetings, but it didn't quite have the impact of being able to connect us with researchers and professionals in the field that could help move the work to the next level. Um, we didn't have good ways of communicating among ourselves, and when somebody new did come on, there wasn't a really good onboarding process. There really wasn't a good way for them to start to pick up some of the history and the information and the knowledge and what states had learned. And the other thing is, is that RPE, for any of you who are really familiar with it, has been going through a major changing process of its own since we submitted our last work plan. And it was a five-year work plan, and boy, it's been blown up. You know, the CDC said, well, we're changing our focus, which is great. That needed to happen. We needed to move in that direction. 
direction. But a lot of us were kind of left floundering and going, oh my gosh, where do we go with this? Where do we go with this? And so now it's great because with this new focus on the community and society level, which we all don't know exactly what that looks like yet, now we have access to the researchers, we have access to the academics and the folks who can help us synthesize all of that and get that knowledge out and then translate it into the community level we can learn from our community folks our coalition folks bring that back then to our collaborative to the researchers and between all of that we can really get some effective work done and that's what the that's what really brought us together was saying hey you know we're we're missing some things we don't have the ability to communicate the way that we need to. We don't have the ability to communicate with researchers the way that we need to. So I think that that was really important that we were able to bring that forward. Um, we did have an intern for a while who helped us pull all of this information together into a white paper. And um, I've got the link here, but we can also share that with you as well. And what I want to do is take just a few minutes to say thank you for joining us in this discussion. I think Cross State Initiative is new, innovative, creative, and amorphous. You know, there's just, it's, it's very gray and fuzzy because it's never happened before. But we've gotten some good things out of it just in the um, year and a half or so that we've been doing it. Uh, we want to encourage others to maybe look at ways that might work for you. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C A L C A S-A dot O-R-G.